Welcome back to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this episode, we're going to go over the scenario that we'll be playing in Space Hulk, as well as look at the different marine models we'll be controlling and what weapons they have. First, though, I wanted to answer an important question from Draggy Duck, one of our viewers, who is asking, do models block line of sight? Very good question. The answer is yes. If you are trying to draw a line of sight to a target, and there is another model in the way, then you will not be able to attack that target. Okay, with that clarified, we're going to take a quick break and then come back and talk about our Space Hulk playthrough. Captain Dallas, this is Command. Be advised, we have several contacts approaching your position. This is Captain Dallas. Uh, we have no contacts. We have no contacts. Over. Next, I just want to go over a couple of rules that we're going to be modifying for our playthrough. You might remember in the uh, rules video, I talked about this timer. Now, normally the Space Marine player is on a clock. They have to complete all of their actions within the time allotted by this timer. But since our actions are going to be submitted by you, our viewers, there's not really any point in putting you on this clock. So we're going to remove that element from the game. Also, we have our mission status display right here. Now, normally the command point tokens would be put on here and then as those command points are used up, the Gene Stealer player, who's going to be my son, Luke, in our playthrough, would move this token as we use up the command points. Because of how we're positioned here, he's going to be over here, I'm going to be over here, we're going to have the dice box between us. It would mean, when I want to look at the command point tokens and see how many I have left, I'd have to reach across over to him, he'd have to reach across over to me to move it. To keep that simple, we're just going to keep this over here on my side of the table, and as I use up the command point tokens, I will move the token myself. Of course, Luke will be here to help remind me if and when I forget. So with that said, yes, Luke is going to be controlling the alien characters here in this game, trying to defeat, with my help, you guys controlling the Space Marine players. Now, we had a fundraiser for our series, and one of the perk levels was the Playmaker level. And at that level, you would know that at some point, you'd be able to submit a move that would be guaranteed to appear in one of our episodes. We're going to try to get through a few of those perks in this series. So we're going to be kicking it out to our playmakers to help us decide what the Space Marine player is going to be doing. Now, if you're not a playmaker, you can still be very much involved. This scenario is brutal. So I am very confident that the playmakers would love your assistance in coming up with some ideas about what should happen with the Space Marine player. So definitely post in the comments below the ideas that you think, and that might be of a great assistance to the playmakers who are trying to formulate what they think should be done when they submit their move. Also, I'm excited to say we're going to be having a contest to give you a chance to win Space Hulk Death Angel the Card Game takes place in the same universe here as our Space Hulk game, but of course it's in card game format. Now the way the contest is going to work, at the end of the series, when all the Space Marines are dead, yes, I'm predicting it now, they're all going to die and we're going to lose. <laughs> when they're all dead, I'm going to have you send me an email and list their names in order of when they died. So starting with the first Space Marine to die all the way down to the end. Now. They don't all have names yet. Well, they do in the fluff, okay? In the fluff, these Marines all have names, but we're going to come up with our own names. The first one here, the painted figure, we're going to call him Captain Dallas. He was featured in the uh, intro video that you would have seen, and uh, Chaz supplied that name to us. Now, I think typically in the fluff, he's a sergeant, so we'll maybe pretend that this is a, an earlier, uh, earlier campaign in, in his career. Now, the rest of these models, they also need to have names as well. So I want you guys to submit some cool names that you think we should use for these Marines in our playthrough. In the next episode, we'll assign, we'll pick a few of those names, we'll assign them to each of the Marines, let you know which ones are which, and then we'll kill them off one by one. Now, I'm really not exaggerating this. Uh, the scenario that we're playing is called Suicide Mission, so the odds of them surviving is not great. I could have picked a more balanced scenario, um, but that might have made this series a little bit longer, and I wanted to be able to show you how this game works in a shorter format, and you definitely will get a chance to see that. You'll also get to see uh, these Space Marines under pressure, which might be a little more exciting and dynamic as well. 
So what I'd like to do right now is set the stage for you and explain how this scenario came about. Basically, our Marines are on a huge floating spaceship and there are several gene stealers on board. And there is a concern that some of them may try to escape on some escape pods that are still active. So our Marines have been tasked with destroying the computers that control the escape pods. However, the commanding officers are fully aware that there are several enemies between us and the control room. And that it is likely any squad sent in will suffer heavy, heavy casualties. So to win, what we have to do is get our model with the heavy flamer weapon within range to launch his weapon into this control room, which is located here. We're actually going to be starting over on this section of the board. So by destroying this control room, we're going to be disabling the controls to activate the escape pods. The problem is our Marine with the heavy flamer only has enough ammo for six shots. So if he uses his weapon up before we get to the room, or if he is killed, the Gene Stealer player is going to win. So it's going to be tough, and there's not really a lot of room for error here. Luke will be starting with two blips, and then each turn receive two more, which means we could be overrun very easily, and yet we can't afford to hang back because he will be able to accumulate models very quickly, making it harder and harder as time goes on for us to complete our objective. But look, it's not all bad. We do have some good tools to work with here. Let's take a look at the models and their weapons. So this is our Space Marine, our one Space Marine, with a heavy flamer. It's very important we keep him alive because if he dies, we no longer have a weapon that can destroy the control room and we're going to lose. Now this weapon costs two action points to fire and those actions cannot be combined with any other action. So we wouldn't be able to move this Space Marine and then attempt to fire the weapon. It can target a square or a model up to 12 spaces away, but it is an area effect weapon. So it doesn't matter which square we target. Let's say we targeted this square here. The entire section, the entire tile is going to become engulfed in flames. And we represent that by placing one of these tokens down. Once the weapon is fired into a section, every single model in that section. So if we had multiple enemies there, each one of them would roll a single die. And on rolls of two or higher, those models are destroyed. Now this flamer token is going to stay in the room or the corridor for the remainder of the turn, blocking line of sight and movement through this particular section. Now if you have a survivor in the area, let's just say this model was destroyed, but this one survived, and that model wants to try to move, it can do so, but every time it moves into a square, which is affected by this flamer token, it's going to have to roll a die again. And again, on a roll of two or higher, it's going to die. So being in the flames is not good, but if you're lucky enough to survive, you don't want to move. That said, this model, because it's right on the edge of the tile, could move backwards one space into a safe area and it would not have to roll a die. Now the catch here is these flamers only have ammunition for six shots. And that's why the game comes with exactly six of these tokens. So every time we fire the weapon, we're going to use one of these tokens and then discard it. And that will help us keep track of how much ammunition is left in the heavy flamer. We also have three space marines that are armed with storm bolters. We talked about these a little bit in the rules section. But here are the models that come with the storm bolter weapons. Here you can see them in their right hands. Now these storm bolters have no limit on range and they cost one action point to shoot or they're free to shoot when you make a move or a turn action and you have a legitimate target. Now when you shoot, you're going to roll 2d6 and you destroy the target if you roll a 6 on one or on both of the dice. So any 6 showing up on a die would destroy a target. So that would destroy a target. That also would just destroy one target. <laughs> this however would destroy nothing. Now that said, if you're targeting a model, let's say that this Space Marine here had shot at this Gene Stealer and missed. If that Space Marine immediately attacks again with no other actions in between, then it's called a sustained fire attack. And now when the dice are rolled, either a five or a six appearing on the dice will result in a hit and destroy the target. So in that situation, a roll like this would destroy the Gene Stealer. If you roll a third or fourth time, it doesn't change it. It's still a sustained fire. Fives or sixes will destroy the target. As we said in the first video as well, when you're on Overwatch and you're holding a Storm Bolter, it's possible for them to jam if you happen to roll two of the same number. Now again, that can only happen when the model is on Overwatch, which is specified with this token here. 
Now, lastly, we have the sergeant. Now, the sergeant also has a storm bolter as well, but this very impressive power sword is in his other hand. So what the power sword allows him to do is when he's facing an opponent in close combat, he can force the opponent to re-roll the highest die result in a close assault. And if he happens to be on guard at the same time, remember, we can put a, a model on guard by spending two action points, then this allows him to wait until after his opponent has re-rolled his highest die result in the close assault before he decides whether he wants to use his power sword to enable him to re-roll his die result. Also, keep in mind, because he's a sergeant, he gets a plus one to his close assault dice rolls. So if he rolled a three, it would actually be valued as a four. Okay, so those are our forces. But before I hand the reins over to the playmakers, it's time for you guys to give them some help. I want everyone to vote on what could perhaps be the most important decision in the whole game. And that is how we are going to arrange our starting forces. As I might have hinted at before, there's very little room for error in this scenario. So this opening arrangement of how we're going to put our space marines on the first tile is very important because you probably notice there's not a lot of room to move around here. Once you get into these narrow corridors, if you don't like how your space marines are arranged, it's going to be nearly impossible and certainly very ineffective to then have to try to rearrange it later. Now at the end of this video, I'm going to give you an overall shot of everything on the board so you can see it all at once. Keep in mind though, these purple arrows, those are the areas that the Gene Stealer player can bring in Gene Stealer models and blips. And that's going to be very important because you might be thinking, well, listen, let's put our heavy flamer at the very back of the line. That way the Gene Stealer model, if he does start attacking us, he's going to have to work through every single one of our models before he has a chance of getting to our very important heavy flamer. The only issue is once we get marching down this hallway, if Luke decides to send a whole squadron of models up behind us, if the flamer is right in the back, that could leave him very exposed. So just think of that as my quick contribution and caution as you're planning how you think these models should be lined up. Okay, so now it's up to you guys to get back to us in the YouTube comments below and let us know how you think these models should be arranged. Now to keep it simple, how about we do this? We'll say position one is closest to the door and position five is farthest from the door. So then when you make your submission, just number them one to five and then specify which models you want in each position. Now I know we don't have names for them yet, but that's okay. You can call one of them the heavy flamer, one of them the sergeant, and the other three, doesn't really matter what you call them, they're all the same, so you just call them space marines if you want. Again, we'll look at which gets the most popular vote, and that's the one that we'll go with. Also, submit some name suggestions for us for these models, and we'll start assigning them, give you credit for that, and we'll start giving them some personality. In the next episode, we'll come back with all of that sorted out, and we'll be able to start playing. Thanks again for watching. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode.